would have to be mentioned. Sorry. Sorry. Um, that would sort of have to be mentioned as like part of the, if I was describing it to someone, um, that, that it is, that it is kind of all over the place. And I find that that, that kind of cross pollination is more common than ever in music. Like, you know, if I listen to a band like King Gizzard, there'll be a song that sounds like some, you know, like cool hipster indie, Tame Impala y dancey thing. And then the next song is like straight up heavy metal. And I don't know how we all would have felt about that a decade ago. But now, not only is that like acceptable, it's actually really exciting. Um, it seems like people are allowed to kind of play around. And when I say allowed, I guess I mean by like listeners. Um, and so like you just see people dipping in and out of worlds um, in a way that frankly comes really naturally to us. I mean, we've always been the kind of band that will go tour with Allison Krauss and then we'll tour with them more and we'll play We'll I'll write a song with Brandon Flowers and I'll write a song with Brad Paisley and I'll like, and not in, I don't mean, I, I don't know. Like just, I just feel like we, we we'll, we'll play we play with Phil Lesh and we play with Connor Oberst. Like like I don't mean to I'm not making references to sound like a jerk, but it's just like we I like this about Dawes the fact that that it's uh, it's got this sort of like big tent. You know, like if you're into if you're a jam fan, you might come to our show, and if you're if you hate jam music and you love Jason Isbell, you might come to our show, I, um, or you might not. I don't know, but you know what I'm saying. Yes. Um, but, if, but if pressed, how would you, how, how would you describe what yours is? Like, what would you, um, like your personally, your sound or style? Um, I think, okay, here's a fun way to say it. It's a, it's a songwriter singer who's obsessed with writing country songs. It's a drummer and a bass player who are obsessed with playing jazz music. And it's a bass player that doesn't like any music except R&B and soul. And they try to jam. <laughs> That's kind of what Dodge sounds like. I love it. <laughs> um, so another part of this, obviously, is the songwriting itself or the lyric writing itself, the storytelling. Um, and a lot of your songs feature very personal lyrics. How do you approach the um, lyric writing portion of that? And what inspires you to write about those topics? Um, as as time goes on, I in, in, in some way, I try to get further away from just like the simply... Um, personal song not because I don't believe in it or, or think it's essential for the writer and the listener but I also feel like I as I've gotten older I have this like overriding feeling of why are you singing this to me or why am I singing this to you and if I don't have a pretty good answer to that question then I get kind of annoyed um and so I try to write with that in mind like if I'm just ha going through some shit and down in the dumps and it's kind of this I don't know, like sometimes dragging you through the mud with me just doesn't seem fair to you um, and doesn't seem helpful. But if I can offer something on top of it and say, you know, this is what I'm dealing with, but this is how I'm choosing to look at it, or this is how I failed, um, I feel like that can be something. But just to kind of drag someone through the mud is weird at this point in my career for me. Like, uh, and I And I also find... I, I admire so much when another writer can inhabit someone else's perspective and kind of exist in their shoes. Um, when people can write about people with different beliefs or different jobs or different genders or, 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 or experiences and be able to speak to their impression of what that life is. I think that that's um, beautiful. I think that that's helpful. Um, so as, as whether it's um, Joni Mitchell or uh, Elvis Costello, like or some of my favorite writers, like I've noticed that as they've gotten older, they get away from that personal confessional kind of style and they do get closer to here's what someone else experienced, someone that I made up or someone that I didn't, whatever. Um, and so I, I, I try to get closer to that and try to get like I, I, I write a little bit less about my own experience and it's so it's less of a represent representation of my experiences and more of a representation of my point of view ideally um but uh also because I have, I have two children one of them the older one is two and so my life is very my, my experiences are very narrow right now and so there's not a lot to talk about other than how much I love them and that gets old um so I can't really just write personal too many personal songs at the moment um 
but yeah, otherwise, like my favorite songs have always been from those writers that I feel like it's it's chewy, it's deep, it's it's beautiful, it's lyrical, but it's also sorry, that's that's Ozzy over there. Okay. Um, it's also um, it's also clear. I like it when Warren Zevon or John Prine or Joni Mitchell um, really write in this way, where I feel like I'm I'm understanding what they're saying. <laughs> Sorry, that's okay. <laughs> um, I have a five year old, so I've been there. Okay. Um, yeah, so you've, 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 I'm you further know. removed now. It's a there yeah. would be a different kind of screaming happening here. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, but yeah, so like I'm, I feel like it's always been that balance of like, how do I make this clear? How do I make my intentions clear? But also, how do I um, do it in a way where it, it 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 invites a second or third or fourth or fifth listen? Speaking of the songs that are personal experiences, I've always wondered if it's difficult sometimes then to perform them for years and years and years after um, having the. I would imagine emotional release of right initially writing and creating a song. Um, it's a cool question. Yeah, I mean, if anything, I, I, that's, I guess that's like one of those. Like, if I feel that way, and I have, where uh, it's it's bringing it's bringing a certain feeling around where I'm not enjoying singing it, then I sort of feel like I failed at writing the song. Um, and I think that's common for a lot of writers where they write a song and then they sing it a few times and then they think like, this actually isn't good for me. I'm not going to sing this anymore. Um, and I, I, I want this song to be cathartic. I want it to be empowering or edifying on some level. Um, and so even the more like upsetting memories, like a song like Now That It's Too Late Maria, when I sing that now, even though there's sad, unfortunate memories attached to it, but the way this song ends, I'm not saying it's like, oh, I really nailed it. <laughs> All I mean to say is like, it just makes me feel better about it because of the way, frankly, just that last verse is shaped. Um, and so I, that's kind of like, if I do want, that's what I was saying earlier. Like, if I do want to write sad stuff, I just want there to be a reason. Um, so if, yeah, if I have that feeling that you're talking about, I just don't sing it anymore because I feel like I, I let the song down. Interesting. Um, tell me more about Misadventures of Doom Scroller. What do you hope that fans get from this album? Um, I th the cool thing about this record, it's the first one I could say this about. Um, I think like if you're like a big Dawes fan and you've been on board this trip that we're on since the beginning or, or, or for a few years, then nothing about this record is particularly surprising in terms of like what we've done to the songs and and the way that they're shaped and how much we're playing with them. Um, I think for people that don't come to shows, but they've been fans of the albums, I think they probably will be surprised. And I like that dichotomy. Um, so in a way it's sort of like we're, we, we we're announcing like, yeah, this is a part of us. It has been a part of us. And, um, and it's, and now we're bringing what has been a part of us on the stage to what's a part of us on the records. Um, it's also just, you know, like it's our eighth album. So if I have a, I don't know, like a, a, a acoustic -y, finger picky ballad that I like, I just don't know if it's going to make the set unless I find a way to give it its own identity, its own fingerprint. And um, not that I, you know, try to get in the way of a song. If all it should be is something simple and small, then I'm happy for it to be that. But with this batch, I just thought like, let's, you know, we're, I'm always trying to think so economically. Why don't I just try to do the opposite? Why don't I try to like, like see how much this song could possibly handle before it's too much and then stop there instead of the opposite. Um, and that's been really thrilling and really sort of freeing. Uh, I know you've toured extensively throughout your career. Um, how has the experience of touring, um, especially now that you have a young family, impacted your music and your lives as individuals and as a band? Well, I could fall asleep just about anywhere. <laughs> um, I feel like I've I, that tour taught me to be patient at airports and in lines because everything is just the sort of you're schlepping a bag or an amp or a guitar somewhere in some sort of inconvenient circumstance. 
uh, at least the, definitely in those early years when we were all in a van, you know, the show's over and merch is loaded and let's get two hours under our belt of drive time and sleep in the middle of nowhere at some super eight. There was a lot of that. Um, so yeah, just that, that just made me sort of feel invincible in a way. I feel like, Oh, I can handle, I can handle anything. Um, because I handled those disgusting, uh, hotel rooms. Um, it's also, yeah, like it's, it's taught me to be in love with being on the move and, and it's, it's helped me fall in love with, I don't know. I think if I wasn't a guy that toured, I don't know if I'd have the same reverence for old creaky bookstores and like dark bars, you know, and I'm not a, I'm not that kind of guy, but it's just something that when you, when that's your life that you become well acquainted with that world. And, um, and it's, it is beautiful. And it is in our case, like America, like we're, we've never had much of a presence in Europe or anywhere else. So it's so our, our, you know, we've toured there, but it's just never, it's never been regular. So our experiences are pretty limited at the States. Um, and I'm really grateful for that relationship to, to, to have this journeyman quality that we didn't know we were signing up for. We just thought we were going to play our instruments and sing our songs, but instead we became like travelers. <laughs> do you have any, uh, I'm sure so much of it is also a blur, but do you have any favorite, uh, legs of tours or cities in particular or places that surprised you um well i do know that like our i was i was talking about this earlier like the our first lancaster show was like 2012 i think and it was one of those free shows um out in this like outdoor amphitheater and we we were much smaller than we are now we're still not some big massive band but like the the amount of people that were at that show was so overwhelming and we were like what's going on like you know we'd never been to that part of the state and there was a lot of people and we were we just we were we were overcome with with uh emotions and gratitude and we just felt like superstars for the night and um so that was like that like moments like that early on were very memorable i mean our first time being at the rhyme and our first night being at the beacon these are big moments for us um and then also like the, the, the dark, not dark, I shouldn't say dark, but the small memories are just as valuable. Like the early days in the van where it was play a show, drive for two hours, sleep for four hours, drive for eight hours, play a show, drive for two hours, and just over and over again. Looking back on that, it's like, oh, it'd be fun to do that again. I don't think that's necessarily true, but it's easy to romanticize it and wish we could do it maybe for two days instead of, you know. At one point we were, it, I remember I went to early on we had 26 shows in 28 days. Um, now it's like we won't play more than three in a row just because like, A, back then we were opening. So it was only like a 30 minute to 45 minute set. Now we play for like two and a half to three hours. Um, and I'm just older, so it's harder to do. Um, but yeah, it's like, it's it's it used to be really extreme. It still is, but just in a totally different way. Do you remember your last time in Harrisburg? I think it was just a yeah at that at that XL place yeah yes the same place yeah that we loved it awesome um well tell us about what um attendees can expect on March 11th when you come to XL again um I think you know we it's the kind of thing where we were for people that have been part of the Dawes thing for the, for a long time and then for also people that just aren't even that aware of us um it's kind of like a celebration of all we made up until this point. I mean, yeah, we're going to play a heavy amount of misadventures of doom scroller songs, but I found that with the way those songs are structured, they're kind of the most fun songs of the set, even for the audiences. Um, so I, I think that that's kind of cool. I, I don't think anyone will um, be bummed that it's too much new stuff or anything, but you know, it's fun to be able to go back to 2009 to 2011 to 2013 and just kind of keep touching on all the aspects of our time as a band. Um, yeah. So I, you know, it's sort of like when you like, you like look at a New Yorker profile on an author you've never heard of. And it's like, they talk about all these novels I've never even heard of, but I, here I am getting to know that the writer themselves, um, it's always such a thrilling feeling. I'm like, Oh, I want to do, I want to, do a deep dive this is cool 
I feel like that's kind of how our show is where if you know us well, or if you've never heard of us, we're going to like touch on this, this whole trip. Awesome. I can't wait. Um, so speaking of that, clearly you've been together for um, over a decade and your music has evolved. Can you talk to me a little bit about how it's changed over time and what the future is for Jaws? Yeah, I think like some, I think, you know, personalities and tastes obviously shape a band so much, but also I think just the nature of your career shapes a band. And with some bands, when they are getting more syncs or sell, doing more streams or selling more physical copies of albums, that might keep them home more, making records in the studio more. Um, and that might have a big hand in who they become. In our case, um, we never sold records. We never had streams or, or syncs. I mean, we do, but not nothing that was paying the bills. It, it was always touring. And so like, that's where, that's where our business is. Our business is always getting people in rooms and playing to them. And so I feel like our development as a band and our, our identity has taken place on stage. And so I think as time has gone on, we've, I've fallen more in love with guitar. I've fallen more in love with, with uh, improvisation and experimenting and b getting lost with each other um, in a way that, that probably wouldn't have happened if I became more of like a studio rat. Um, so I think like that's that's something that's just changed over time just by the nature of the shape of our career um and i'm i'm really it's it's fun because i don't ever see it until after the fact anyway it's not something you can sort of game um it sort of presents itself and you have to just kind of accept it can you talk to me a little bit about um who your biggest musical influences are who do you guys listen to on the road yeah i mean i think we're all over the place like everyone has different stuff i mean like i was saying earlier our bass player doesn't even really like song songs like he likes great bass playing he likes motown and stacks and and just like really good pocketed playing um and then for me it's it runs the gamut of like i love chris christopherson for his lyric writing i love uh, Joni's probably my number one hero because she has the lyrics and she has the voice and she has the music i mean most people don't have all three of those things um and then i love warren zevon for his sense of humor i love frank zappa because he, he is his stuff sounds so insane um and so like as a writer i'm kind of looking at how people are putting together chords and writing words. But then if I want to, if I'm thinking as a guitar player, it might be more listening to Jerry and, and, and even, and even some jazz like Herbie Hancock or, or, or Wayne Shorter or something. And then um, my brother and our, and the keyboardist Lee, they're, they're very accomplished players in a way where they're, they're always talking about very advanced jazz stuff that I, but they all, again, like they, they, they understand the sanctity of a song. They understand the brilliance of a Bob Dylan record. So they know when a song needs less, it doesn't need color. It doesn't need speed. That, that, that's something I'm really grateful for because I feel like most people that develop the kind of chops that those two guys have, particularly, they um they can't help but shredding. And and I don't think that our music calls for shredding. Um. So yeah, we're we're kind of it's kind of all over the place. It's not like we all get on the bus and all think like let's all put on the same record. That's just not that's just not the vibe. Um, I have one last question and I will let you go, but I wanted to thank you again for this. Um, in the beginning, you were talking about some other artists that you have collaborated with in the past. Can you share any of those experiences and are there any dream collaborations that you hope to pursue? I, when it comes to collaborations, I feel legitimately like the luckiest person in the world. And so for me to have other dreams on top of what I've already been given would just feel, um, gluttonous um but i yeah like um, most of them just happen by accident and they happen like getting to sing songs with joni mitchell is just not a dream i ever would have thought to have like it was so crazy that that would happen to me because i've always worshipped the music that she's made so much and then to be like hey come sing so her songs to her with her was just like over the top and then like similarly, like playing with Phil Lesh, like we, we, I love the Grateful Dead. And then the idea of like, now I'm on stage next to him and I'm singing these songs, I'm playing these solos and I'm standing next to him. Like, this is gnarly. Um, so yeah, it's hard to be like, but I'd love to sing a song with so-and-so. Like it just, it's, 
um but uh you know like i i a lot of this stuff like it's already been scratched you know like we we like um yeah like like writing songs with brandon flowers has been like a, an incredible dream backing up connor oberst was an incredible dream he was he kind of taught me how to write songs when i was a little kid and he was just the guy from bright eyes i didn't know him um so yeah it's like i feel like you know yeah we're not you don't see us on it like stage at msg but the fact that that we have these relationships that we have that kind of matters more than anything like i'd rather be pals with and this uh, again I, i'm trying to talk in a way that doesn't make me sound like a jerk but i enjoy being like you know yesterday my like jackson called just to chat like and that's insane i was i like again another guy i learned how to write songs from and i, I would rather have that than play to ten thousand people at msg um so i do in that sense i do feel like the, i'm the luckiest and and i'm, I'm eternally grateful is there anything that I didn't ask you about that you want um, Harrisburg to know about in advance of your show? Just that, um, yeah, like those those two Lancaster free shows, I don't even remember the name of the venue, just really left us a mark on us. And um, and I hope that people know that, that it's like not just another stop for us. And I know that for Harrisburg is not Lancaster. I know it's like half hour away or something. All right. But I also know it's pretty close, like yeah, for... Thanks. Yeah. So, um, so I, yeah, I just, you know, I feel like sometimes in, in smaller towns, um, people just sort of feel like, oh, they don't give a shit. This is just a stop between here in Chicago or here in whatever. And, um, it's not the case for, for, for our Harrisburg play. That's awesome. Thank you. Right on. I look forward to seeing you on March 11th. Thank you so Thank much, you. Taylor. All right. On. Thanks. Bye. Bye.